be back at Bethel. We always miss being here, being with the, our loved ones. Uh, just enjoy this place tremendously. I hope you do the same. Uh, I've always, uh, when preaching, uh, to come out with something that's, uh, start off with something funny, try to draw the, you know, the audience's attention. And uh, found out some interesting news. You may laugh with me. You may cry with me. You may comfort me. <laughs> uh, you know, Sarah laughed about it when the Lord said that they're going to have, you know, the promised seed, the child Isaac, you know, and Sarah overheard him talking to Abraham, and Sarah laughed. So if Sarah laughed, you can laugh. <laughs> the Lord uh, found out that he's going to bless us with another child. So <laughs> that's when you start laughing. <laughs> <laughs> or crying. Or saying, what in the world is going on? But very thankful, because I know children are a heritage of the Lord. The fruit of the loom is his reward. Children are a blessing. And if I'm going to raise a child, I'm going to raise it here at Bethel. It's a good place to be. Amen. But when you have something coming up, breaking news, or stuff that hits you like a, a brick, you need to have a, a good, uh, good outlook, a good conception of you know, who the Lord is and what man is. You need to have a good biblical perspective of what he is because you need to be stable. And you can only be stable if you recognize who the Lord is. You know, he says, be still and know that I am God. If you don't recognize him as the Jehovah God, then you're missing the boat. If you don't recognize him as being the redeeming son and redeeming God, then you're missing the boat. This is something that you can put your feet down and stand firm on when the storms of life come. Now, I am not saying a new child's going to be a storm of life, but there's going to be many a storms associated with that new life. But I'm thankful this morning that we need to have, to keep us grounded, a good biblical view of God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Ghost. We talked a couple of weeks ago about the three in one, the Father, the Word, and the Holy Spirit, or the Holy Ghost. We talked about the unity of the Godhead. And I've heard many uh, preachers over, over the years that have said that they do not, cannot tell you how that is so, how there is three in one. So I'm going to tell you something funny again this morning to make you chuckle. I'm going to be the first one to tell you exactly how that works. He is God. That explains it all. He wouldn't be the ten in one. He could be the ten in one, okay? It doesn't matter what God. He is the three in one. If he want to be the 10 and 1, the 20 and 1, he is God and there is none else. There's none beside him. There's none that can stay his hand or say unto him, what doest thou? Okay? We need to recognize and have the right perspective of who God is and who man is. You know, he told Jeremiah, uh, through the destruction of Jerusalem, he said, Jeremiah 32, 27, in verse 17, he says, Ah, Lord God, Jeremiah says, Behold, thou hast made the heaven and the earth by thy great power. It was by his great power that he made the heaven and the earth. When the storms come, that's the power we're looking for. I need that power to get to the next day, to get to the next minute, to the next hour. Ah, oh, Lord God, he's the one who made heaven and earth. That's what we talked about in the triune God. He created the heaven and the earth. Missy Jane told me if I got up this morning, I needed to preach on John 1.1. I said, okay, here we go. <laughs> in the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. Okay? He goes down to verse 27 in Jeremiah. He says, Behold, I am the Lord, the God of all flesh. Is there anything too hard for me? That's what he told Sarah. Is there anything too hard for me? Is there anything too hard for the Lord? I look at the days ahead, and I'm like, how are we going to do this? <laughs> How is this going to happen? <laughs> it's going to be hard. It's not too hard with the Lord. When the Lord is your focus, and he's the ground that you're standing upon, it don't matter what's ahead. The Lord's been with me since I was born and up to 46, half of Sarah's age, almost half is Abraham's age, when they found out this news. 
But he's telling Jeremiah, Jeremiah's going to all kind of chaos with uh, destruction in Jerusalem. He doesn't know what's going on. But he says to him, he says, I'm the Lord of all flesh. Everything's under my hand. I do as I please. That's the omnipotent God. That's the, uh, you know, the sovereign God. That's who he's talking about here. The, uh, he says in Matthew 28 and 18, he gives the uh, gospel commission to his uh, disciples to go out and preach the gospel, okay, to all the world. And there's going to be trouble ahead. They're not going to be well received, okay? There's trials ahead. There's trouble. There's hardships. That's why it's, it's not too hard for the Lord. So in Matthew 28 and 18, he tells them, he says, And Jesus came and spake unto them, saying, All power is given unto me in heaven and in earth. Nebuchadnezzar realized he ruled amongst the armies of heaven and the inhabitants of earth, and none can stay his hand. He's telling them in times of affliction, times of trials, times of hardships, listen, all power is given unto me in heaven and in earth. Go ye therefore and teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Ghost. There's the Trinity, okay? Teaching them to observe all things, whether I commanded you, and lo, what? I am with you. I am. He's the great I am. He told Moses, he said, you tell him, I am that I am has sent you. He said, here he goes, I am with you. You got each other. You're going out amongst many trials, many tribulations, many sorrows you're going to face here. But he tells him, he goes, I am with you. And that's what we need to see. He's the great God Almighty. He has all power in heaven and in earth. And that's the perspective we need to have and we can go with. It's a basic foundation. There's simplicity in the Lord Jesus Christ, the Word. And we can take that simplicity and move great mountains with that. But it's just a little bit of faith, the Lord says. Okay? And let's look at man for a little bit. Okay? Man's depravity, how low, you know, we must decrease that he might increase, right? You look at what he says concerning man. In, uh, Psalms 39 and 5, it says, Behold, thou hast made my days as a handbreadth. And that's just a little bit of time. Compared to eternity, we're just here, just a, not even a wink, okay? It's a handbreadth, there's like four fingers. That's how short it is. We don't have long here on this earth. So he says, Behold, thou hast made my days as a handbreadth, and my age is nothing before thee. Verily, every man at his best state. Every man at his best state. A lot of people teach every man in his best state is holy, righteous, saint of God, entered sainthood. But he's telling us the man's best state is vanity. You know what vanity is? It's nothing. There used to be a song saying, oh, I shouldn't be saying this, but it's the best song ever. You're so vain. You probably think this song is about you. It was a good one. It was right on point. I know a lot of people like that, but... Vanity, you know, someone says all things are vanity. <laughs> you know, the preacher, that's what he said. He said, but that's the best of man. When somebody tells you there's good in somebody, there's no good in anybody. There's none that doeth good. There's none that seeketh after God. Well, that's not good news, you know. It's not good news. That just shows you how, grace, how much grace is in God, how much love he has for his children, how much we can depend on the one who has what? All power in heaven and in earth. He says in regeneration, in John 17, in the high priestly prayer, he says, as thou hast given him power over all flesh, that he should give eternal life to as many as thou hast given him. He has all power. There's nobody who's going to stay his hand. There's nobody in regeneration. Everybody that God's chosen, he's going to regenerate. Why? Because he has all power. None can stay his hand. None can say, whoa, Lord, slow down a little bit. Okay? That's in regeneration. The Holy Spirit will come into each of the ch uh, child of God's heart sometime like we talked about between conception and death. Hallelujah. As soon as that baby was conceived and we found out sometime between this conception and death, the Lord can, can be there in an instant. Once that last child of grace is born into this world, the Lord's coming back. <laughs> Baker asked me this morning, he said, when is the Lord coming back? I, I just gave you the answer right there. <laughs> when the last child... God is born into this world. So I know 
that the Lord rules and the Lord reigns. And he's given us a child. And we just found out we should be glorious. It makes the troubles ahead. And we can look at God. We can look at man. We must decrease that he has increased in our lives. When we get a little, a little bit lower, a little bit lower each day, we come to the feet of Jesus where we can worship the King forever and ever. Thank you. ago, Karen and I just laid down and uh, get ready to go to bed and go to sleep and the phone rang and uh, I didn't know who it was and it turned out it was Timothy and Molly and they don't usually call us that late and I overheard something about a baby and I said, what? Who? And Karen said, they're going to have a baby. Who? <laughs> they, they, they don't have a baby. A woman has a Who's having a baby? <laughs> Tim and Molly. <laughs> oh. <laughs> it took a little while to go to sleep. I'm not sure I woke up yet. <laughs> I know they greatly appreciate your prayers very much, and this we consider this to be wonderful news. Truly indeed are a heritage of the Lord. When you read the book of Job, you read a lot of the content is a conversation between Job and three of his friends that he eventually called miserable comforters. And they were miserable comforters primarily because they kept trying to diagnose Job's situation rather than just coming and, and giving him comfort in his state. We know by reading Job chapter 1 that he had uh, experienced a, a great loss in many different ways, including his own members of his own family. But not everything they said was wrong. In fact, his three friends said a lot of things that's very, very true that we need to take notice of. And in the fifth chapter of the book of Job, I want to look at verse 19 just for a moment. For this is words spoken by Eliphaz. Of course, he's speaking of divine inspiration. And he says to Job, he says, He shall deliver thee in six troubles, and in the seventh no evil shall touch thee. Now we notice that he mentions the number six and the number seven. He mentions troubles, but he also mentions deliverance. He says, he, having reference to God, he shall deliver thee in six troubles. Now that number six and number seven in the Bible are very significant. The number six is one number short of seven, correct? And we know that seven is the number of completion, it's the number of perfection. The number six is the number of man. You look at Revelation 13, 8, and you'll find there where it says that 666 is the number of man. That's three sixes. Uh, we find six being a number of the days of creation, but it wasn't complete till day number seven, right? That's when God who created everything in the first six days, on day number seven, the Lord rested. Uh, he ceased from his labors in creating the heaven and the earth and all the things that's therein. We find then the Lord gave a commandment to Israel for them to work six days. And the seventh day, which would complete the week, was to be a day of rest. He then also, in Leviticus chapter 25, told them to work for six years. And then the seventh year, they to let the land lay out. It was a Sabbath year. And this was to go on for seven times, which is 49 years. And the 50th year, we call the year of Jubilee. So you have six days, the seventh day, the day of rest. Six years, the seventh year, the year that the land would experience rest. Remember when um, Joshua then marched around the city of Jericho, God gave them the plan, and the plan was to march around the city one time a day for what? Six days. And then on day number seven, there's to march around seven times. One is always one, six is always one number short of perfection. It always has been, 
always will be, it's the number of man. Seven is God's number of total perfection, completeness, and maturity. Here he says, he shall deliver thee in six troubles. Uh, it doesn't mean that you're just going to have six troubles. And number six here carries with the idea of the troubles that you experience here in life from the time that you are conceived until the time that you reach the point of departure. At the point of departure, your life becomes complete. And here we have number seven. He says, he shall deliver thee in six troubles. And in number seven, he says, in the seventh, no evil shall touch thee. And that's a promise that we have concerning the providence of God. That was a great truth that Eliphaz declared unto Job. Now, we have trouble in this world, don't we? That's what the world is. It's just, it's just trouble. Uh, we look in Job 14, 1. And Job said, man that's born of woman is full of day, is, a man that's born of woman um, is uh, short in life and full of, uh, and full of troubles, what I want out of that. Um, he says, your life is brief, and the brief life you have is one that is full of trouble. Now, the Lord Jesus Christ taught his disciples in John 14, 1, he started off like this. He says, let not your hearts be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. For in my Father's house are many mansions, not so I'd have told you so. And I go to prepare a place for you, that where I am there you may be also. If I go to prepare a place for you, I'll come receive you unto myself. Again, that you may be where I am. That's, he gave them one of the greatest answers, of course, in the Bible, is where their heart should not be troubled. Because the Lord was taking care of some preparations so that one day when they left this world, they could go and be with him in glory. And the preparation was him going to the cross and satisfying the legal requirements of God. Um, and so in this life, life is brief. Again, Job 14, when man is born of woman, is few days. That's what I wanted a while ago. Man is born of woman, is few days, and he's full of trouble. Man really doesn't like to hear that statement. He doesn't like the fact that he's here just for a few days, but there's many illustrations of this in the Bible, but James gives us one that's uh, well known. He asked the question, what is life? He said, it's, it's a vapor. Now, have you ever seen a, you know, a steam uh, kettle or whatever, you know, on the stove, it's got water and you heat it up and, and all the go -go whistle goes off and you see the steam coming out or whatever. How long does the steam last? Just a brief second, right? And it just kind of goes away. And that's what life is, what James says. He says life is very, very brief and it's a troublesome life. The Apostle Paul wrote a lot about trouble, uh, especially in 2 Corinthians. In 2 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 8, he says, I will not have you ignorant, brother, concerning the trouble that we had in Asia. He said, we were pressed out of measure. He says, above strength, despair of life. But then he says, but we had the sentence of death within ourselves that we should not trust in ourselves, but in God which raiseth the dead. Now, when he thought about that, that God raises the dead, it showed him that his trust should not be in himself. His trust should be in God. If God can raise the dead, he can take care of any problem or any troubles we might experience here in life, correct? In the book of 2 Corinthians 4 and 8, he says we are troubled on every side. Every side, he says, <laughs> there is trouble, but not, we're not in distress. We're perplexed, but not in despair. We're persecuted, but not forsaken. And we're cast down, but we're not destroyed. Notice four things he says we are, but also four things that we're not. All right, we're in despair, but not perplexed, right? He says we are persecuted, but we're not forsaken. And we're cast down, but we're not destroyed. So we need to remember the balance of that, correct? The second part of this statement here. And in the seventh chapter, we find in verse 11, where again, for the second time, he says, for we are troubled on every side. He says, we came from Macedonia, we were troubled on every side. Our, our flesh experienced no rest. He says, there was fightings without and there was fears within. But God who comforted those who are cast down has comforted us by the coming of Titus. That God can give you comfort directly or indirectly. On this occasion here, Paul said, God who comforted those who are cast down, remember, but not destroyed, 
He says, send Titus our way, and Titus gave us comfort. Now, I, I like this statement in, in chapter 1 of 2 Corinthians, about verses 3 and 4. He says, now, the God of all mercies and the God of all comfort, who hath comforted us in our tribulations, that we may comfort those in all their trouble with the same comfort wherewith he hath comforted us. The very comfort that God has given you, directly or indirectly, will comfort other people also. You know, the same comfort he gives you, you're to take that comfort and you're to try to comfort somebody else when they're going through their trials and their tribulations and their troubles. So Paul had trouble on his mind a lot when he wrote in 2 Corinthians, you see. So we live in a very troubled world. We look over here in the book of Psalms, Psalms 34, verses 18 and 19, and you find here where the psalmist says that God delivereth the right, the many are the afflictions of the righteous, but God delivereth him out of them all. How many afflictions are, go along with the righteous? He says many. Many are the afflictions of the righteous, but the Lord delivereth him. Now, the him in this case is Jesus Christ. Many of the afflictions are the righteous. Sometimes the word righteous has reference to the family of God. In this case, I know it's Jesus for two reasons. Notice what he says. Many are the afflictions of the righteous. The Lord delivereth him. One, him. Out of them all. He says, not a bone of his body shall be broken. Now, we know that has reference to Christ, don't we? But I believe that same principle applies to the Lord's children. Many of the afflictions of the righteous, but the Lord will deliver us eventually, ultimately, out of them all. All right? And because not a bone of the body of Christ was broken, that means not a member of his family is not going to go to heaven. It means every member of his family, not a bone of his body was broken. It shows the completeness of the offering and sacrifice of the Lord Jesus Christ. Even though nails went through his hands and nails went through his feet and a sword pierced his side, not a bone of his body was broken. Everything about his offering sacrifice was totally complete, perfect, righteous, and holy, and acceptable in the sight of God. The covenant that he has with you will never be broken. The work that he did on your behalf, on behalf of the children of God, it, it's nothing can ever take away from that, you see. So we now live in this troubled world. A while ago I mentioned John 14, 1, where the Lord said, Let not your hearts be troubled. Come on to verse 27. And he says, These words I speak unto you. And he says, My peace I give unto you. My peace uh, uh, I speak unto you. My peace I give unto you, not as the world giveth. He said, Let not your hearts be troubled, and neither let your hearts be afraid. Now, what will help us greatly when we have things that can cause us fear is the words of Christ. Knowing, he says, my peace I leave with you. My peace I give unto you. You have peace with Christ. But he says, not as the world gives, because the world does not give peace. The world just adds trials and tribulations and misery unto the burdens that we bear here. But the Lord Jesus Christ gives peace. My peace I leave with you. My peace I give unto you. Not as the world giveth. Let not your hearts be troubled. Neither let your hearts be afraid. Now, what really gives us comfort in our trials and tribulations is the presence of the Lord, his deliverance, correct? Now notice again the text. It says, he delivereth you, he shall deliver you in six troubles, and in the seventh no evil shall touch thee. Whatever our troubles may be, the Lord is a God of deliverance. Let's go back again to 2 Corinthians 1, and Paul says, where the sins of death within ourselves. That we should not trust in ourselves, but in God who raiseth the dead. For he hath delivered us from so great a death. Now I think he's talking about here the death of uh, trespassing sins, the death that we all came under of the curse of the law, sin and death. He's delivered us from that great death. And he doth deliver. That shows he's doing it on a regular basis, on a daily basis. He doth deliver. And it's in whom we trust he will yet deliver. You got past, you got present. And you got future. We're talking about a delivering God who's promised to be with his children and deliver them from whatever they may face here in this world. Now, look over here in the book of Joshua, chapter 1, and we find as that chapter opens up that Moses has died. And God has appointed a man by the name of Joshua to replace him and take his place. 
And God is speaking to Joshua. And he says, Joshua, as I was with Moses, so I'll be with you. Now, Joshua had been with Moses when they were in Egypt. Joshua had been with Moses when they were in the, in the wilderness. And now Moses is dead, but Joshua's going to lead Israel across Jordan's River into the land of Canaan. But the Lord tells him, as I was with Moses. Well, Joshua saw what happened when God was with Moses. Joshua experienced, he saw, he experienced God being with Moses, how God used Moses to put 10 plagues upon the Egyptians and to bring an entire nation of a million plus people out of there without the loss of one. And the psalmist tells us not one feeble one, not one faint one came out of Egypt. They were all strong regardless of their age. They were all strong. As I was with Moses, so I will be with you. That had to be tremendously encouraging. Now, Brother Tim mentioned Matthew chapter 28. In verse 18, where the Lord said, all power is given to me in heaven and earth. Now he's speaking to 11 men right here when he makes that statement. All power is given to me in heaven and earth. Go ye and teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Ghost, teaching them to observe all things which I have commanded you, and lo, I'll be with you all the way to the end of the world. He promised to be with them. And when you contrast commission number two with commission number one, you get more emphasis on this. Commission number one was the 12 men in Matthew chapter 10. That's when he tells them that they're not to go to the way of the Gentiles or the Samaritans, but rather to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. Now, if salvation was based on means, especially preaching the gospel, the Lord Jesus Christ just cut a lot of people out with that statement. Because he's not going to allow them to preach the gospel to the Gentile people. I don't know what people think about when they read that and if they just consider it. He's going to send them strictly to the lost sheep of the house of Israel, that is to the Jewish people. He said, lo, I'll go, he said, in Matthew chapter 10. But then now in Matthew chapter 28, he now opens it wide open to anybody and everybody, Gentiles as well as the Jews. And he know, they know some of the opposition they experienced under that first commission, didn't they? And now they're going to preach the gospel beyond the Jewish people going to the Gentile people. What should they expect there? But the first thing the Lord says before he gives them the commission is, I have all power in heaven and in earth. That's the first thing he wanted to go into their minds, sink down in their minds, that I've got all power in heaven. i got all power on this earth right here. Now, I want you to go and teach all nations, Jews and Gentiles. And I want you to teach them to observe all things I have commanded you. Now, this is a very important point. They did not have the liberty to teach something beyond what they'd been taught by the Lord. And they had full responsibility to teach everything that the Lord had taught them and nothing less. If they taught more than the Lord commanded them, it was too much. If they taught less than the Lord commanded them, that was too little. The Lord said, teach them to observe. It means to hold on to, to guard. Teach them to observe all things whatsoever I have commanded you, and lo, I'll go with you all the way to the end of the earth. When I go back and look at the patriarch's lives, and see so many of the things that they faced. You know, it's incredible uh, what their journey was in terms of their journey of faith and the steps they took and the obedience they had when they were faced with so much of the unknown. You take Abraham, going back to Genesis chapter 12, when God found him then known as Abram, the land of the earth of the Chaldees, he tells him to get up out of that land and leave his kindred and go to a land I will show thee. He had never seen the land before, never been to that land before. And that's what the Lord told him. He says, blessing, I will bless thee. You know, those who bless thee, I will bless. Those who curse thee, I will curse. And said, ye, I will bless ye in your seed, which shall be a blessing to all nations. That's a lot to take in. <laughs> if you're Abraham, that's a lot to take in, right? What did Abraham do? He got up and by faith. He left the land there in the child days and traveled down there to the land of Canaan. I'll come to Genesis chapter 21. And when I come to Genesis 21, I find Abraham's 100 years old. And I found Abraham has got a child, 100 year old. Now just look at it, here's a 100 year old man walking along, well start with toting a baby, and it's his. And then maybe a year later, he, he's got him by the hand. 101 years old, and by the hand, he's, he's walking a one year old little child along, and it's his. 
he comes to a place called Gerar. And the king of Gerar is a man by the name of Abimelech. Abimelech says, we know that the Lord is with you. <laughs> right. <laughs> We know that the Lord is with you. He doesn't say why, but he sees that the Lord is with him. Brother, I'm going to tell you something. When God is with a man, when God is with a woman, a child, a person, it doesn't matter who it is. When God is with them, you should be able to see it. And they could see that God was with Abraham. He had to be with Abraham, first of all, for him to have the child at 100 years of age. And to give him the courage and the strength and everything else to be the father to this child, which was named as Isaac. Then we come to chapter 26 and his son Isaac's in the same place. And Isaac was going to start digging the wells that his father Abraham had dug who the Philistines had come and stopped those wells up. But as they dug one well and got it cleaned out, here comes the, uh, you know, the people who dwelt in the land there and they ran them away. So they went and redug another well, found fresh water, but the same thing happened to them again. And then they went and dug in a new place. And there was water. And they had room. God blessed that. And they named it Rehoboth, which means God has made room for us. They recognized God and his providence has made room for us in this land here. And they had the well. Well, you know, Abimelech came to Isaac. You know what he said? He says, we know for certain that the Lord is with you. <laughs> and because they could tell for certain that the Lord was with them on both occasions, they came with peaceful intentions. They didn't want any conflict with Abraham. They didn't want any conflict with Isaac because they could see that the Lord was with them. Now I want to talk about Jacob just a minute or two. You've got Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. The Lord meets Jacob seven times in his experience. And in experience number one and experience number seven, you're going to find where it says, the Lord said with him, I'll be with you. Experience number one is found in Genesis chapter 28. We find where Jacob's fleeing from his brother Esau. And he goes out into the wilderness. He lays down that night to go to sleep. And he puts some rocks under his head for a pillow to put his head on. And during the night, God appears to him in a vision. And he saw heaven open up. And he saw angels ascending and descending upon a ladder. And he, the Lord spoke to him in that vision. He says, I'm the God of your father Abraham and also of Isaac. He says, the dust of which you're laying right here, I will give unto you and your seed from the north, the south, the east, and the west. He says, for I will be with you, and I will keep you, and I will bring you into this land, and I will not leave you until my word has been accomplished. What a message. That's the message God gives to Jacob the first time he has an encounter with the Lord. Remember, he's fleeing from Esau at this time. Uh, Jacob has been living up to his name as a trickster, uh, you know, as a, a deceiver, deceitful. He's living up to his name, but now the Lord meets him on the road. And the Lord says, I'll be with you. He says, and I'm going to keep you. And I'm going to bring you. And I will not leave you. So I've done that which my word has said. We find where Jacob called the name of that place Bethel, which means house of God. He had an experience there. And then he says this, well, if the Lord will be with me, when he says if, he's using the word if as if he's saying since. Since the Lord is with me and he's going to bring me, and he's not going to leave me, forsake me, he says he's going to be my God. <laughs> yeah, he's going to be your God, Jacob, because as God, you belong to him as his child. Okay, you didn't choose God for him to be your God. He's already your God. That's the first time he met Jacob, and that's exactly what he told him. But I come over here to the book of Genesis a little bit further, 54 years further. All right, we fast forward 54 years down the road. Jacob had 12 sons. One of his sons, the name of Joseph, was sold into Egyptian slavery, right? That leaves 11, and he thinks that Jacob is dead. Now, I want to just hold that thought there just a minute, because I want to go just a little bit further, and I'm going to tell you what uh, Jacob said unto Pharaoh when he was 130 years of age. At 130, Jacob is in Egypt now. 
and he comes before Pharaoh, the greatest ruler, the most powerful ruler, the most powerful empire that existed at that time. Jacob goes there as an ambassador of God. He's a child of the king. He's a child of the king who's the Lord of hosts, the captain of the host, and he's the most high. Here's the meeting. The most powerful man on this earth versus Jacob here comes before him and speaks unto him. And he asks Jacob his age, and Jacob says, I'm my age at 130 years of age, and few and evil have been the days of my life. That sounds like Job 14.1, doesn't it? Man born of woman, few days and full of trouble. He says, uh, I'm 130 years of age, and few have been my years. 130 years have passed. He says, just been a few of them. And they've been evil. That means very unpleasant. He had had a lot of problems. You go back to Genesis chapter 35. I'm going to see just a few of those. In Genesis chapter 35, verse 8, there's a woman in the name of Deborah who was a nurse to his mother, Rebecca, and she dies. Not a lot said about this woman, but everything said about this woman tells me that she was very faithful, very loyal, and a very outstanding woman. She was a nurse to Rebecca when she uh, was brought to marry Isaac. She dies. And the Bible gives us an account of, her, of, of the burial that takes place when they bury her, showing great respect to this woman. Just a few verses later, somebody else dies. His wife, Rachel. And he, she was the love of his life. And she dies. And they, he buries her. She's the mother of Joseph and Benjamin. Then just a few verses later, his father Isaac dies. There's three in Genesis 35, all connected to Jacob here, his, his mother's faithful nurse, his wife, and his father, they all die in Genesis chapter 35. In Genesis chapter 37, he experiences the loss of his son Joseph, who was, a, you know, he gave the coat of many colors to. Then notice, I didn't say Joseph died. I said he, lost, he suffered the loss of Joseph because Joseph didn't die. But in the mind of Jacob, he did die because they brought back a, uh, his coat of many colors dipped in the blood of an animal. And when they showed it unto Jacob, he just assumed that a wild beast had devoured him. And in his mind, he grieved just as strong as he would have if Joseph had literally been dead. Because in his mind, Joseph was dead. He didn't know any different. That's four people in the life of Jacob now. And he suffered three of them by death. One he thinks has died, but nevertheless has suffered the loss of. A famine comes to the land. Jacob sends 11, 10 of his sons. He's got 11 left now. He sends 10 of them down to Egypt to get food. He keeps Benjamin with him. Nine of them come back. Joseph keeps one, Simeon to guarantee that when they come back for food the second time, they're going to bring Benjamin, his younger brother. And we're going to find where Jacob refuses in the beginning to allow that to happen. But here's what he said. He says, Simeon is not. Joseph is not. Simeon is not. If you take Benjamin, he doesn't come back. You'll bring down my gray head with great sorrow. My hair is with great sorrow. He said, all these things are against me. Have you, have you ever been there? I'm sure not quite like Jacob, but have you ever just thought everything's against me? Nothing's working out. Everything's going wrong. Everything is against me. He's not going to let him go. But we find where Judah pleads with him and says, we cannot go back down there if we don't take Benjamin. The man's already said, uh, you're not getting any food second trip. The only way you get food is you come back. You got to bring Benjamin. Jacob reconsiders. He says, Joseph is not. Simeon is not. He says, now you're taking Benjamin. And he says, may God Almighty bless you and deliver Simeon and Benjamin back into your care. When you read that, you can tell that Jacob now has become reconciled. He said, if I be bereaved of my children, I'd just be bereaved. What Jacob has done now is put his whole case in the hands of the Lord. That's what he's done. And so they go back down there. And they take Benjamin. He thinks Joseph is dead. 
Simeon's in Egypt, now Benjamin's in Egypt, that leaves him nine. All these things are against me, but he says, uh, he has a change of attitude. He says, Lord, if I be bereaved of my children, I be bereaved. He says, but may God Almighty be with you. Now, that's an important statement. You know, when I was growing up, I heard my daddy say lots of things that are found in the Bible. I heard my daddy use many different words and expressions that I found recorded in the Bible. I want to talk about this in just for a moment. God Almighty. You know, when the first time it's used in Genesis chapter 7, 1, and God speaks to Abraham, he says, I am God Almighty. And you know what he's about to tell him? He's about to tell him he's going to have a child at age 100. That, that's going to take the Almighty God to do it. That's the first time. And then you're going to find where Isaac, and he's going to bless uh, Jacob and give Jacob instructions to go back to where they came from to get, a, to get him a bride. And he uses the word God Almighty be with you. And then we find Jacob here speaking to his children. When he sends them back down to Egypt, you know what he says? He says, God Almighty be with you. Now a little bit further we come over here in the book of Genesis and you're going to find in Genesis chapter 47 where Jacob is before Joseph and he says, God Almighty bless me in the land of lust. So you got God saying, God Almighty to Abraham. You got Isaac saying God Almighty to Jacob. You got God saying God Almighty to Jacob. You got Jacob saying God Almighty to his children. And you got Jacob saying God Almighty unto Joseph. That's an expression we don't need to ever lose out of our vocabulary. As we believe in God Almighty, and we need to use that expression more than we do, one expression is fading quickly is expression the Lord will. I heard that all my life. My father used that all the time. If it be the Lord's will. I'll see you son if it be the Lord's will. He never did tack on if the creek don't rise either. You know how people say, well, I'll see you Sunday. If the Lord's willing, the creek don't rise. And I said, what's the creek got to do with it? The creek going to keep you from getting to the house of God if the Lord's willing? <laughs> That's unbelievable. It's just somebody already preparing not to go. That's somebody already preparing to defend themselves, you know, to justify themselves and not going. Well, something might come up. It may not be literally the creek rising, but something may come up. I may get a headache. I may get a, a backache. I may get a toothache. Uh, it might thunder. I might see rain clouds come up or something. And uh, therefore, I'll see you if none of these things happen. I'll be there, Lord willing. And the creek don't rise. But if the Lord's willing, he'll find, you'll find a place where you can get over. I'll tell you that now. And the expression, God Almighty. You notice, in other words, Abraham says it to Isaac, his son. Isaac's son, Isaac says to Jacob, his son. Jacob says it his, all of his sons, and then his son Joseph. What do we see? We see something passing down the road, don't we? We see something passing from one generation to another generation. What are some of the things you say now? You heard your father say, your grandfather say, and your grandfather passed it to your father, and the father passed it to you. Are you passing along to your children? Are you using the expression, the Lord willing, to your children? Are you talking about the Almighty God to your children? Are you telling your children that God's got all power both in heaven and earth? Are you telling your children, my people shall be willing in the day of my power? Are you telling your children that God Almighty by his power created the heaven and the earth and by his power sent his son in this world and through the blood of his power, my friends, the power of his blood, you have redemption? Are you talking about God Almighty this morning? Are you talking about God Almighty? I'm you, I don't care what kind of shape this world gets into. I don't care what kind of shape uh, we're currently in. It may be in tomorrow. There's an almighty God ruling and reigning in heaven on his throne. Look at him on the earth. There's his footstool. And as Brother Tim said, nobody can stay his hand or say to him, what doest thou? Well, you know what happened, don't you? God's going to take Jacob and bring him down there and reunite him with all of them. Let's go to Genesis chapter 46. After we see his sons come back and they bring the wagons, they declare to Jacob that Joseph, thy son, is alive and he's governor in Egypt. Can you imagine that kind of report? You think your son's been dead for a number of years and now your son's come back and say, he ain't dead. He's alive and on top of that, he's next to Pharaoh. He's down there. He's the governor over all Egypt. 
he's, he's the reason the world has already had, you know, completely died out with this famine that's going on. He, he, he can't believe it. He just can't believe it. And then he finally believes it. He says his heart revived. And he says, it's enough. I'll go down to see my son. And so as he's making preparation, God appears to him for the seventh time and the last time. Seven, that number of completion once again. Here's what he says to him. He says, Jacob, fear not to go down to Egypt because I'll be with you. I'll be with you as you go down and I will bring you back out. Now Jacob doesn't come back out alive, but he comes out. First of all, when he took his last breath, his soul and spirit left that body and left Egypt and left this world, went back to glory. And then Joseph and his family took the body of Jacob and brought him out of the land of Egypt and buried him back in Canaan among his fathers. The Lord was with him. I want to say a little something about Joseph, Jacob's son. When Joseph's brethren sell him to the Ishmaelites and he goes down to Egypt, we pick this account up in Genesis chapter 39 in the beginning of the chapter. And the Bible says in verse 2 that the Lord was with Joseph and he was a prosperous man. And he's in the house of Potiphar as a servant. Now think about this. Just a short time before this, Joseph was in the land of Canaan in the household with his father Jacob. He's now down in Egypt as a servant in the household of Potiphar. Canaan, Egypt. Abraham, Potiphar. That's a long, that's a big difference, isn't it? In just a short period of time, he goes from being in his father's house, having a father-son relationship in the land of Canaan, the land of promise that flowed in milk and honey. He's now a servant, a slave in Egypt in the household of Potiphar. But that reminds me of the Lord Jesus Christ. There was a time the Lord Jesus Christ, the second person of the Godhead, was in heaven having wonderful fellowship with his Father. And he voluntarily left heaven and came down to this world and became a servant slash bond slave. Joseph is a slave and he's done nothing wrong. The Lord Jesus Christ left heaven and came to this world as a servant and he's done nothing wrong. That word servant, you go over here to Philippians 2.5. Let this mind be in you was also in Christ Jesus, who being in the form of God, thought not rather be equal with God, but made himself of no reputation, took upon himself the form of a servant. That word servant there means bond slave. That's what Jesus came. He done no wrong. You know why he came? Because of his great love for you. And to me, this is a fulfillment of a type found in Exodus chapter 31. In Exodus chapter 31, if the law was if you bought a Hebrew slave, man, man, and he served with you for six years in year number seven. Here we got six and seven again. And he served with you six years in year number seven, he was to be given his freedom. If he came in by himself, he could leave by himself. But if he came in and married a wife, no children, his wife would go back out with him. But if he married a wife and she had children, he had to leave alone. The wife and the children had to stay. Unless he voluntarily said, I love my master, I love my wife, I love my children, I don't want to go free, I'm going to stay here and serve because of my love for my master, my wife, and my children. And they would take him to the door. And he put his ear right up to the door and take an awl, and they would drive it right through his ear right there and put a hole in his ear and mark him as a servant who voluntarily stayed because of his love for his master, his wife, and his children. That's why Jesus Christ came to this world, the love that he had for you, and he came to stay here. And that's what he did for 33 and a half years. And he lived the life of a servant. Isaiah 42, 1 says, Behold my servant whom I uphold my elect, whom my soul delight in. The Lord Jesus Christ was the servant of all servants. He came, he left heaven in a place of, you know, again, with all blessings up there with the Father, and he was willing to leave there and come to this earth right here where he became a bond slave for 33 and a half years. 
He did it voluntarily. He did done no wrong. It says that Joseph, the Lord was with Joseph. He was a prosperous man. And Potiphar saw that the Lord was with him and blessed everything that he did. Now, think about this for a second this morning. When we say things like the Lord is with him, the Lord blessed him, the Lord delivered him, the Lord fed him. That's what Jacob said over there again in his last days. He said, the Lord hath fed me all the days of my life. Do we really believe that? You got a job, you make money, that money you pay your bills, that money you go to the grocery store and you buy your food and you take it home and you cook and you eat that food. Do you ever think about you wouldn't have been able to have done that had not God blessed you to be able to do that? Isaiah chapter 55, he says, As the rain and the snow come down from heaven and water the earth, it gives seed to the sower and bread to the eater. If you've got bread to eat, it's because somebody sowed seed. If somebody sowed seed, he was able to sow the seed because God sent rain and snow down from heaven to water this earth right here. That's why Jacob said, God had fed me all the days of my life. You know, when Jacob got down to Egypt, there was the famine, but he got down there and Joseph fed him. Did he say anything like, Joseph fed me, Pharaoh fed me? He said, no, God fed me. God fed me all the days of my life. He fed me when I was 10. He fed me when I was 50. He fed me when I was 100. He fed me when I was 130. And he's going to live 17 more years. He's going to die at 147. And God fed him all 147 years of his life. He blessed him. He fed him and redeemed him from all evil. I'm telling you, God literally intervenes. God literally in this providence can override. He can overrule. He can intervene and bless you in a providential way. Direct your mind, direct your heart, direct your steps, and bless you to use your gifts and talents, my friends, to pray God for you and your family and your loved ones and to give and help the poor and contribute to the church. All those things is because God has blessed you. Those are not just words we throw out. They're biblical expressions. Listen to the Apostle Paul in 2 Timothy 4, 17 and 18. He said, when all men forsook me, he says, the Lord stood by me. Paul literally meant that. He said, the Lord stood by me. All men forsook me, but the Lord stood by me. And the Lord strengthened me. And the Lord delivered me from the mouth of the lion. And the Lord shall deliver me from all evil. And the Lord shall preserve me into my heavenly kingdom. Did you notice all those things? The Lord stood by me. The Lord strengthened me. The Lord delivered me. The Lord shall preserve me. Paul's just not writing to take up space. <laughs> Paul's writing based on experience. Paul's writing by divine inspiration. Paul literally believed in the intervention of God Almighty in the lives of his children. You know what a deist is? Deism. Deism is the thought that when God created all things, he then set an alarm clock of time. Set it on the wall over here, on the shelf. And then he just stays there doing nothing until the alarm clock goes off and then he comes back. That's what deism is. We are not deist. I can hear you that. We believe in the direct and indirect intervention of God Almighty. We believe in the guiding hand of God, the leadership of God. We believe in God blessing us with the things we stand in need of from a natural perspective. We believe in a God who can bless us with all spiritual blessings in heavenly places. We believe in a God who can bring us to the house of God and strengthen our souls and strengthen our hearts and give us a comfort and give us peace that passeth all understanding. We believe in Almighty God, my friends, that can lift our hearts and spirits above the cares and troubles and trials and tribulations of this world right here. We literally believe that God does those things for us. There's just not words and expressions that we throw out there to make people feel good. We literally mean it. <laughs> you believe that, right? <laughs> well, wink at me. <laughs> Smile at me. <laughs> Shake your head at me. <laughs> I know you are. I'm just carrying on with you. He shall deliver thee in six troubles. And the seventh, no evil shall touch thee. 
I love to read the closing days of Jacob's life recorded for us in Hebrews chapter 11 by faith. Uh, uh, Jacob, I may say, I meant Jacob here. By faith, Jacob raised himself and sat upon his bed and leaned upon his staff, worshiping God. See, he did that by faith. In his last hours, his last days, they spent here upon the face of this earth. He's still worshiping God. He's got to have a staff to lean upon. <laughs> I know I make reference to my father every now and then, but uh, he left me a lot to make reference to. And I remember when he had just a few days left, he was in the hospice center. And my dad was always a loving and generous man. And the nurse says, well, you know, we don't take no money. We get paid. We don't take no money from the people here. But he says, your dad gets his bill full out and gives us $10 and $20, and he won't take no for an answer. So when he's asleep, we take him, we put it back in. <laughs> I mean, that's the kind of man he was. When they came through the visitation, one of the neighboring farmers there, his wife, come through, and she says, one thing I can tell you about Brother Lawrence, whatever he said he would do, he did it. That meant more to me than anything else anybody had to say. And I know I've told you this before, but I know the, I think the Lord was in this. When he passed away, he passed away around 6.30 in the morning on Sunday morning. And after we made the call and the arrangements and everything, I looked at my brother, and he looked at me, and we said, well, what do we do now? And we both at the same time said, well, let's get ready and go to church. So he lived about six, seven miles from there. So we drove back to Dad's house, got ready, went to Andrew Primitive Baptist Church at 1030 on Sunday morning. On the way, on the way home, I told Karen, I said, that's just like Dad. He made sure to die early enough for us to get to church. <laughs> now, I believe that. <laughs> I do. He would have disturbed him greatly if he thought his death would have kept us from the house of God. He shall deliver thee in six troubles. And the seventh, no evil shall touch thee. I'm telling you, when it comes to the end of life's journey and the trials and tribulations have been met over and over and over again, Almighty God, and He's kept you and delivered you time and time and time and time again, He's not going to leave you short at the very end. He's going to be there. He's going to see to it that no evil shall touch thee.